practicing the Buddhist teaching by working here. So I'm really pleased we've got here Liz and Abai Matti, who are two members of our centre team. So I haven't done a count in my head, but in terms of the number of people, um, at the moment there's, uh, is it not counting off phrase six? I think that's right, that's right. Yeah. Um, six people at the moment, uh, fully would, would be seven, but yeah, at the moment, uh, six. And um, yeah, I'm not going to go through uh, who they are and their, their responsibilities, just sort of, uh, yeah, have that context. They're, they're, they consider that they're all here in spirit, and uh, uh, yeah, what we're doing tonight is probably, I think, a honouring and a celebrating of, of them. I, we were actually uh, saying in our little Sangha team meeting before the, uh, the class started just uh, what we appreciated about the centre and just how incredibly well run it is. And I know myself just how much the, uh, the centre and the centre team has been through in the last couple of years. So many changes in people, mm -hmm. the pandemic, um, yeah, the loss of our accountant, um, it's, it's been through a lot of uh, challenging times, and yet things keep happening, and uh, still have this, uh, yeah, amazing place running really well and opened for events like uh, like Sunday night. So I wish I had more time to actually actually prepare a, um, a thank you and a celebration of that, mm. um, but yeah, the two of you. Uh, Liz and I might have been absolutely central to uh, what's happened over the last couple of years and that we're still on the road and in pretty good shape. <laughs> <laughs> so Brian Matty is our centre manager. He took on that role back in, was it June? Uh, yeah, end of May. End, end of May last year. So he's been centre manager for a little less than a year. Having worked at the Buddhist centre for a little bit longer than that, though. <laughs> it's been a little bit longer. <laughs> You'll probably yeah. cover that later. Yeah. <laughs> <Wait for me>. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, very pleased that by now just stepped up, taking on that, that responsibility of really sort of managing the overall uh, running on a day to day or week to week level of, of our uh, centre, which is holding an awful lot. And Liz is uh, responsible for this. Oh <laughs> and it works. <laughs> And actually, a couple of years ago, probably just over two years ago, wasn't it? Um, you had you found that being the property manager meant actually you had to be responsible for the online property. Yeah, and that's when yeah. you're working in that was a job. That was a jolly big job <laughs> to take on at no notice. So yeah, well done to uh, to you. So I'm going to leave um, you all in. Uh, their hands. So this is going to, uh, well, I don't know if it's been an interview or a dialogue, but somewhere in between perhaps, we'll but see. Uh, we will <laughs> see. And there'll be an opportunity to talk later about um, things that come up, I'm sure, for us in connection with uh, what, what we hear from the three of them. Thank you so much, Rachel. Well, how lovely <laughs> <laughs> to have this opportunity. Um, so we were just saying actually that. We don't know whether all of you will know if we talk about team-based white livelihood exactly yeah. what that is. So it might be worth if you just give us a little, a, li a little overview, an overview of what that is, and then we'll talk more. Yeah. Ask you more directly about your own experience of it. Yeah, yeah. So probably because the words are a little bit difficult to keep saying, I'll probably say working with the sangha or working in a Buddhist context. Uh, we often use the terms team-based right livelihood, uh, right livelihood being one of the limbs of the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path and uh, what well, team-based being what makes it more of a Buddhist context, everybody working together. So really it's Buddhist run businesses. Uh, we call them often team-based right livelihoods. TBOL, I don't really like acronyms. So I'll probably say working with a Sangha or team-based right livelihood. And you've been working in, or oh, working with the Sangha for yeah. a very long time. Do you want to, <laughs> <laughs> a very long time. Yeah. Um, so not only here, but in other contexts as well. Mm. So do you mm. want to start by just giving us a bit of an overview of your, yeah. your Buddhist working life? Yeah. Well, it's been interesting to have these conversations because it, it's made me look back and realise that I've been working with Buddhists for 
the last 25 years. So basically all my working life has been spent uh, working in team-based white languages or working in Buddhist contexts. Uh, the first uh, job that I had was um, working for a, a gift shop. I'll just give you a very brief overview. We used to have a, a business in Cambridge called uh, Windows Evolution. Some of you who've been around a while will have remembered the uh, evolution shop in Cambridge. And I worked in the evolution shop in Ipswich. So that, that was where I started. And I did that for about eight years, I think. I think. Uh, and then I came to, no, that's not quite right, five years or something, came to Windows and then joined the centre. And I've been at the centre for the last uh, 17 years. I've been working here for 17 years. So quite incredible when you, when you realise things like that, kind of how the time has gone. Yeah, so 25 years in all. So you must be so young when you. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that but out. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a long time working in team based white livelihood. But what was it? Yeah. I mean, how did you get into it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there were there were kind of two sides to it. There was there was uh, uh, like a carrot and stick, if you like. There was an attraction, and then there was also a, a, I wouldn't quite say well, maybe almost almost a repulsion from other things. And the attraction was that I was coming along to classes. So I was coming along to classes like this and uh, realizing that the Dharma was something that I wanted to kind of make central in my life. And one way to do that was to uh, live in a community. So that was the first thing was um, uh, uh, the people who lived in the community also ran the uh, gift shop. But in a way, what, what attracted me to that was the fact that um, the people were so interested in me in, in the classes, you know, and they, they were kind of helpful. And um, as I was wanting to explore Buddhism more, I just wanted to spend more of my time doing it. And so in a way, it was kind of a, the obvious thing to do was just, OK, this, I can live with Buddhists and then well, I could also uh, work with Buddhists. So, as you pointed out, I wasn't that old, which is some pleased you said that. Um, but I was, I was starting to uh, think about a, a career, and I, I trained as a journalist. And at the time, I, I had some uh, work experience. So this is the thing that put me off. Uh, so this was the character. This was the stick rather than the character. I, I got some uh, work experience for. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Vanessa program. It's a bit like Jeremy Kyle. You've probably heard of. Kind of, yeah. So um, I, it, that was my first kind of uh, taste of um, working in, in journalism, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, because it made me do this. Um, and just the contrast is just incredible. I mean, uh, the, the people that I was going to be working with were quite, it was quite a cynical environment. It was a very competitive environment. And I remember when people found out I was on work experience, they just weren't interested in me. So the contrast was that I was meeting these people who wanted to talk, wanted to explore things, they were interested, and there was meaning, and then there was this sort of, well, it felt like a kind of void of meaning, and, and, and all this kind of cynicism, and that was a very strong experience for me, that was a very strong kind of, um, you could almost say an insight experience to sort of realise that, well, I could take this path, you know, I could, I could, uh, I mean, working in a gift shop obviously was not like an ambition, uh, but I could, you know, I could work with Buddhists, I could explore this thing that really touched me, or I could take this other path, and admittedly, that was a particularly bad version of the path, the alternative, um, but I could see where it led, you know, it just led to more, a more kind of uh, a sort of cynical view, and, and um, yeah, just not getting any better, really. Mm. So yeah, so in a way, I had I had this moment where I had a choice, and um, in a way, yeah, fortunately for me, the other choice was really bad. Uh, so it sort of pushed push me more into into working mm. in Buddhist business. So how's that? You talked a bit. Of, so there's the, some, you know, the carrot and the stick. There was the mm. the things you didn't want to do, and then the things that attracted you that sound quite spe specific. How is that? changed or has that changed over the years have you noticed that yeah no it has definitely i mean i think the first um 
well the first pull mm. yeah, was 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 that context it was it was having that support for um for that kind of burgeoning buddhist practice mm. i didn't really you know at that stage i didn't really fully know what buddhism was i didn't i you know it was starting to have an effect on my life but it was an unfolding and so having the opportunity to be around people who are more experienced in particular who was also on that path kind of helped to uh, give that uh, uh, some form but also i think i mean basically i think at the beginning i i needed um i needed support i needed mm. I needed that support, you know, not so much an emotional support, although I, I definitely got that, but more a kind of a, a support for that, that, that initial inspiration uh, and to sort of help me to understand what that meant. So I think the initial um, uh, reason, the initial pull was because, yeah, I, I, I needed, I needed in a way the Sangha. You know, I needed other people to be able to guide me mm. in a way and to be able to, um, I suppose, model what it was I was trying to do. Mm. And I think that's still the case. You know, I think, you know, I think that's uh, probably that's something that always stays with you, no matter how much experience you have. You always want to um, draw on other people's experiences and, and have, have your inspiration, have your aspirations mirrored back. I mean, I'm sure that's why people come on things like Sangha night. You know, you come because you because you want that resonance with other people. You know, you want that thing that's going on for you, which may not be recognised in other contexts. Kind of, um, yeah, uh, mirrored back to you, sort of um, given given some sort of form. So that's still the case, but I think that um, uh, over the years it's become. It's become clear to me that that uh, bound up with with spiritual life is the need to uh, be more other regarding, you know, to to if you like the altruistic dimension, to give it a give it a kind of phrase. Um, and working in a Buddhist business is is an opportunity to do that every day. You know, it's it, you in a way you're presented with opportunities always to sort of go beyond yourself. Sometimes that means going beyond what you think of as yourself, uh, you know, where you think who you are. And sometimes it means, you know, doing things that when you don't quite want to, or when it's challenging or that sort of thing. And Sriji Gosha mentioned, you know, there's been quite a few objective challenges to meet. And I think all of those things, they, they are difficult, they are sort of stressful, but they they feel less so when you realize that it's, it, it is what you, well, I won't say you, what I need to be doing with my spiritual life is kind of moving out of my, my self-centered mm. view. So I think, yeah, I think to start with, it was inevitably a, a, a bit self-centered. Mm. You know, I was looking at Buddhist practice as self-development, mm. something I needed to help with, encouragement, so forth and as well as needing that still i it's now an opportunity i think it's an opportunity to to grow specifically in, in the area of moving outside of that that inevitable sort of self-clinging mm. i'm just wondering how how long had you been practicing when you first started working in two years right now here? well i was very new mm. i mean i think i've been coming along to classes for just a few months or something I mean, I think I was sort of, I mean, I, I, I came across the Dharma in, in Ipswich, which is my, my hometown. And we don't, I mean, we didn't have a centre for years, you know. The centre was out the back of a car, as it were. It was just set up, uh, set up in a room each time. And so it was quite a small sangha. Not now, I mean, it's much bigger now. Uh, and I think, you know, a, a, a young guy coming along at that stage, I, I was quite unusual. And so people were kind of interested, uh, interested in me, and I've completely forgotten the question that you asked me. <laughs> so, uh, oh no, it was about yeah, how long had you been practicing when, oh, you, right, when okay. you came up? When I you could have started. answered that much more simply, couldn't I? Yeah, no, it was good though. Come on, all right, carry on rambling. Um, <laughs> oh dear. But you hadn't. So I had yeah, I've been coming along a while. Let's say I've been coming along a few months. So was it like a conscious decision <laughs> to sort of just go? 
oh yeah that looks good or was there something that kind of because you said about you know yeah. these two paths that you could have taken but yeah did it feel like it was a conscious decision to take this path or was it more of a draw in some way that no, no, I mean, I'm a bit of a mystery to myself, if I'm honest, because I think of myself as quite a, a sort of a, a cognitive type, mm. you know, somebody who thinks. And, uh, but what I'm aware of is that all the big decisions I made in my life, particularly all the spiritual decisions, if mm. you like, all the decisions that involved commitment in Buddhism or, or decisions within my Buddhist life, they've all been made... Um, in some other way, which I don't quite understand. I don't mean in a mystical sense. Mm. I just mean that, um, well, I suppose I was led by intuition, uh, a kind of gut response, a heart response, mm. I suppose. So there wasn't really a point where I sat down and, uh, and thought, oh, well, these are pros and cons. It was, it was almost, I'm being kind of drawn in this direction and, um, uh, well, why wouldn't I? You know, mm. it's it feels good, it feels right, and 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 of course, once you start to do that, you discover more about it, and then you meet more people who are involved, and so forth. And, yeah. Do I was just wondering about the um, you know, you've, you've stayed working within a Sangha context for many years, and there's obviously something that keeps you going within it. But what are some of the sort of the practicalities about how team-based work like this looks different to you know what your average job? might be in terms of people who don't who might not know yeah how right. you do things or... mm, mm. i mean in some ways i'm not very well qualified because <laughs> as i said i've spent all my working life you know <laughs> working with buddhists <laughs> so i don't want to uh you know i don't want to condescend people who work in sort of other jobs uh but um i think there are certainly things that we do which are quite different mm. i mean we start each day reporting in so we start each day talking about ourselves you know which i think is quite an unusual thing and it means talking about yourselves in quite an open honest way as well so you know i'm in effect i'm lizzie's manager but you know she's not trying to impress me i don't think you are anyway when we're reporting in the mornings you know it's connecting as as friends it's connecting as sangha members it's it's deepening our understanding of each other it's is getting to know each other. So I think that's quite different. And, and, and given that that's the first, well, the first thing we do is we salute the shrine. So that's obviously already setting a different tone. Um, but uh, the, the, yeah, the fact that the next thing we do is that we, we kind of connect on that personal level. I think it does, it does set up a different, mm. uh, a different tone for the, for the rest of your working day. You know, you in a way you we are relating to each other as friends, as mm. but Sangha members, as sort of fellow fellow Buddhists, and that that's the primary thing. Uh, I mean, the other things I suppose that we do that are different are um, we we do have time set aside for things like study. So recently, we've been studying a uh, talk on um, on right livelihood. So I mentioned team based right livelihood. That we're exploring together well, what is what is right livelihood and um, that is the context you know, mm. for what we're what we're doing and sometimes we might do pujas we might do practice together so there are kind of more buddhist things if mm. you like that we do they're more overtly buddhist things as well as the kind of personal uh, connection but i think also that um there's there's also something there's just something different in my mind, I'm sure in some very good businesses this is the same, where there is um, uh, where the where the connections with each other are in a way the most important thing. So when I took over as manager, I felt that my responsibility in a way was the team. So people say, "Well, I manage the centre." I mean, I manage the centre team, and actually, that's that's a lot easier. In my mind, the idea of managing the centre, which is a which is a bit abstract, uh, for me, it's a it's a real delight because it means supporting other people. It means supporting very capable and competent people like Liz, you know, to to do to do the work uh, that she does and and that my, all my team do. And I guess I'm I'm just 
convinced that the more you uh, support and trust and encourage people, the more they'll want to work and the more they'll, they'll give to what they're doing and, and then the fruits will be there. So, mm. you know, I see my job as being to, to look after those people, mm. which is a delightful thing anyway, mm. but it's also a really good thing in the context of what I was saying before about, you know, in a way my main practice being sort of going out going outside of myself, you know, going, doing things for other people with other people in mind. When you're talking, I was just thinking then about how, because it feels like that, that ripples out, that kind of, um, that way of working with others, but also, I mean, I do have this, I know when we spoke before, you described something as being like, um, when you worked in the evolution shop, oh, yeah. of being, you know, the front of the shop was all the, pretty things and then but behind was where the the work <coughs> happened and it was like this something different going on in yeah yeah that supported what was going on out the front mm. but how you're describing it then of um supporting other people i was just wondering how that because that feels like a practice of sangha mm -hmm. and how that ripples out then further than just the immediate team mm. do you have a sense of that of how how what goes on like behind the scenes, as it were, how mm. that ripples out mm. into the wider sangha, into the wider sort of practicing community, or, or does it not? <laughs> well, no, it does. No, it definitely it does. Um, I mean, the thing you were saying about the, yeah. about the shop, that was, that was um, the image that came to mind, though, because it was a really small shop, mm. and it had a really small back room, but in a way, the back room was massive, because that was where we explored the Dharma. Mm. And um, that influenced everything else. So I suppose, well, I mean, we're downstairs, you know, we're in the basement here in a way. This is where we do most of our work. You don't really see us. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you could feel as if you're kind of separate uh, from everything else that goes on. Um, but I think that it, for me, uh, it's all Sangha. Mm. You know, the context for the Buddhist center is Sangha, the spiritual community. You know, again, it's about the people. That's, that's the most important thing. That is, that is what it's about. And it's the same in the basement. You know, I mean, that, that's what we're doing. For me, Sangha is, is an activity. Um, uh, sangha is, I, I think of Sangha as a verb. You know, it's, mm. it's something that you do. Um, and because of that, it's something that you, you're always creating. So, yeah, I mean, it can seem like, you know, we're on computers a lot of the time and doing, you know, sometimes fairly menial tasks, I guess. But that is very much for me within that same context. So being here tonight feels congruent with turning up tomorrow and reporting mm -hmm. in with people. It's Sangha for me is any any situation where Dharma activity is happening between people. So then it doesn't, doesn't really feel, it's different, obviously, where I don't, I'm not up front doing a lot of classes, um, but, uh, but it doesn't feel like two different worlds. It's, uh, I feel as if we're just, we're doing our work, we are creating Sangha, just as Sangha is happening tonight. Mm -hmm. And what, what continues to, well, I'm presuming that you continue to be inspired by working mm -hmm. in a Sangha yeah. context. And you've sort of said a bit about that, but are there specific things that inspire you at the moment or sort of have kept you going over the years? Because, you know, there are, there are challenges yeah. that come with working in this way. Well, yes, there are, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've realised over the time that I'm, in, I'm, I'm inspired by by change. I mean, obviously not all change is good, mm. right? Um, but I mean, I suppose I'm inspired particularly by transformation, change in people. And I mean, you've said, you know, things can be difficult. People have difficulties, you know, everybody's had difficulties. I've had my share of difficulties uh, whilst, whilst working uh, here and other, other places. Uh, but there's something there's, there's something about having difficulty and there's something about having difficulty within the context of transformation. And I think for me, I'm, 
I'm just very inspired by that possibility of change, that, that not just the possibility, but actually witnessing transformation mm. in people. And I find that sustains me even when things are difficult, because it, it, it seems to me that difficulty is an inevitable part of transformation. It's an inevitable part of a Buddhist practice of the spiritual life. Um, so in a way, I'm sort of sustained. I'm sustained by that. And I'm particularly sustained by seeing it in other people. I'm not, I'm not that good, I don't think, at seeing it in myself. Sometimes I get things reflected back to me in such a way that I realise, oh yeah, you know, I'm not the same person as I used to be. Because I mean, I'm sitting here talking to you tonight and this isn't something that I think of myself as somebody who people do. Does that make sense? Why did I say that? The right <laughs> way? Do you know what I mean? There's still a view of me that's not congruent with me sitting here now talking like this. And I actually find that quite inspiring as well. You know, I find the fact that uh, I still think I'm somebody else that I'm not, and then clearly I have changed, <clears throat> and that other people have changed. And when people are having difficulty, I, I kind of feel like I see beyond that. I see the I see the fact that uh, uh, that's a temporary thing, and and within the context of practice, um, I mean it's it would be glib to say it's always a good thing, you know, because sometimes people have. Dukkha, you know, they have serious things going on. You know, there's, there's stuff, stuff happening for them. Uh, but the context of the Dharma always gives that a perspective. It always gives that a much bigger uh, perspective. And that perspective is always one of growth, mm. always one of uh, transformation, no matter what, no matter what. So, I mean, we have had a lot of difficulties you know, in recent times, and, um, and and there's no, you know, there's no denying that, there's no getting away from that, and, and some things can be very painful, obviously, you know, losing, losing Lee was a very, very painful thing, still is a very painful thing, who's our, one of our team members, um, and yet, still having the context, uh, it, it does give everything such a lot of meaning in some ways it kind of it increases your desire mm. for for um uh well freedom i suppose you know wanting wanting something wanting something better it's it's something that sort of is pulling on your heart you know it's drawing mm. you forward in that way quite despite yourself or quite despite myself mm. Mm. A bit of a question around like how do you not go through the motions but i mean you've just kind of basically <laughs> said it but i just think you know like yeah. i mean you know i mean i've worked here for mm. almost three years now and there's been some times when you know you come in you salute the shrine you do this and it all you know it's the same sometimes with any sort of spiritual practice of sometimes you slightly go through the motions yeah. or i know i am anyway um oh, right. <laughs> 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 to that on camera <laughs> Um, you can cut that. Yeah, yeah, we'll cut that out later. <laughs> um, I mean, I've lost my thread now. That's yeah. All right. yeah, but how do you, because it is quite a thing every day, Yeah. Um, coming in, checking in with the same, I mean, yeah. you know, a lot of people have experience of being in groups where you tune in with people, or when you're on retreat, you might tune in. Yeah. But doing it every day with the same people, it's quite yeah. a practice, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it is. And you've been doing it a lot longer than I have. So yeah. Yeah. I just there's a I think there's a question for me about that. Uh, there's obviously things that that stop you or me or whoever from just mm. it's not it doesn't feel like a place where you can just go through the motions, at least not mm. long term, because mm. it kind of yeah you'll um you come up against yourself the whole time or you come at the yeah. situation is one that the conditions sort of don't allow that. Yeah. which I think means that it is, it can feel like it's um, a, a challenge, but yeah. like in, usually in a good way. Yeah. But how does that play out over all the years that you've Obviously it hasn't played out over 25 years. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is a good question. <laughs> um, 
I mean, I, I I do find the fact that I've worked here for so long a bit bizarre. Mm. Actually, I mean, I, I'm not I'm not somebody who readily looks back in time. I'm not somebody that does that very well for some reason. So we've had a few conversations around this, and mm. that's really helped me to realise that it really has been years, as long as I've been here, doing it for that length of time. And there are things about there are things that have been very continuous during that time. I'll take another example. Mm. I not so much now because I often go for a walk with you at lunchtime. Mm. Uh, but for much of my time here, I would I would go for a walk at lunchtime and I would walk I walk along the river. Mm. And it's the same river, isn't mm. it? I mean, you know, I walk the same stretch of the can. So let's just say, you know, altogether I've done that for 14 years or something, you know, give or take, give or take time doing other things. Um, and given that that's the same stretch of river, in a way, the experience of being there has never been the same mm. twice. I mean, the big factor in that is me, of course. I mean, you know, sometimes there are swans, sometimes there's rain, mm. so forth. But but the main thing has been I've been different. Mm. So I've experienced that stretch of river as every possible sort of thing. You know, it's been a threatening, horrible place. You know, full of evil, nasty people, and it's been a wonderful sort of open. Uh, pure land practically and it's been everything in between you know yeah. um because of how i've been and i find that continuity is really good for me mm. because it's the same stretch of river you know essentially it's still the swans it's still the boats it's still people on bikes um so so i'm the common factor if you like the other common factor and i see my mind you know i see i see where i'm at and it's the same coming to work Mm. Um, you know, and I still, I still quite often have a sense of slight, um, it's a sort of a mixture of um, kind of um, apprehension and a, and a sort of a sense of um, responsibility uh, coming into reporting to, in a way, to not go through the motions, mm. to, to, to actually uh, speak one's experience. And that that is a challenging thing, and 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 it. To be honest with you, I wonder whether going through the motions might just be a bit of a rest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I've ever really had that. Mm. I think it's more of a. Somehow, you know, you salute the shrine, you sit down with other people who are also practicing, who who you know well, who you built up friendships with, connections with, and that calls on you. Mm. It calls something from you, if you like, and. Um, I don't know what going through the motions would be like, you know. So partly what is really good for me and keeps me engaged is the fact that when I walk up to work, just like when I walk by the river, it's a different Abiomati each time, mm. you know. And um, and sometimes I only really get to see that when I arrive, you know. That's only when it's as if the team is a kind of mirror. Mm. for me at that point and so at that point you know you, you then just say what it is you know it might not be a big deal mm. it could be something quite trivial but it's it's always um in a way it's always new because i'm always a different person i mean i'm not mad <laughs> <laughs> just to say that i don't mean I'm practice. i just mean that you know a large part of my practice is kind of watching the mind you know? and um yeah, so so it's never the same thing twice. Yeah. <laughs> but if I do go through the motions, I'm sure you let me know. Yeah. Um I was just thinking a bit about the well, I've got a question here about the ethos of working at, at the centre. Is there something you can say a bit about that? I mean, you've said about you know what we do, the practicalities of tuning in and whatever but I'm sure everybody because well people are at Sangamai they understand a little bit about at least about Buddhism and meditation and things but yeah what is it that sort of is some of the, the guiding principles or the ethos behind how we're trying to to work together that yeah. helps create all of this yeah 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 well I can try and say something about that I mean I suppose I can say what what the challenges are mm. of 
trying to do something different. Mm. I mean, a lot of what we do is is common to a lot of places of business. You know, we 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 have to look at income and we have to you know, run things, we have to organize things. So there's always that tendency for things to get drawn into being an ordinary ordinary working environment. And I and I, I don't like saying that because I respect people who do all sorts of other jobs. You know, people are doing good things, maybe in some ways even better things than I am, well, certainly, you know, in, in vocational jobs and so forth. So I don't, I'm not saying that um, uh, it, you can't do it in other uh, situations, but that they're at the same time working here has to be a something different. And, um, and I think that it's a very unusual project in that Sangha is the main thing. You know, everything else is subordinated. If you can. Everything else is a, is a means to Sangha. I mean, we are a charity, so the profit motive is already not mm. part of what we're doing. Um, uh, uh, but, but everything organisationally is, I suppose, so that people can come in and do this. I mean, not listen to me. <laughs> uh, you know, to to uh, contact uh, the Dharma, and um, and and that kind of governs uh, everything else uh, that we do. I mean, I'm really pleased, for instance, that in recent time we've moved to Dharma economy mm. uh, because that really reflects that. I think that's a really brave step. Mm. You know, that's because uh, I quite like business, so I tend to think, well, yeah, good to make, you know, good to get the money, and so we can reinvest and so forth. So then when somebody says, well, let's just leave it to people, they can just pay what they want, and we'll just encourage them, uh, I get slightly nervous about it. But at the same time, from the point of view of the ethos, it's completely right. And I think things like that are really, they're a really bold statement. Mm. They're, they're a way of um, declaring to yourself and other people what it is you have confidence in. Mm. You know, you have confidence that when you create spiritual community, uh, that is attractive to other people uh, and it's of great benefit to other people. Um, so I guess that, you know, I guess that's the, uh, the vision and it, it um, well, I suppose, to be honest with you, it's probably partly my, partly my responsibility uh, to make sure that, that that comes down into, you know, what we do, what mm. we then do. And I think I think that's something of the challenge is to work out, you know, it's a grand vision and it's a very inspiring vision, but what does, what does that mean when you need to make a decision about booking a room, or, you know, which event to run, or whether to advertise it this way or that way. Um, and I think that's always a work in progress. You know, I don't think there are any sort of simple answers uh, for that, um, but I think it's always, absolutely essential to make sure that that's the main thing you know, so it's about the dharma and in a way more so than that it's about the sangha you know because that in a way that's what we are doing at the same time um and when we'd spoken before you had to sort of uh a thing about how you see sangha I mean, you've said already about it being um a verb. I always get the verbs and nouns around the wrong way. It's oh, something that I'm not very good at. That. Yeah. <laughs> it might be an objective. Maybe someone could tell me. That's yeah. Great. yeah. Um, but you said that you know, sangha is something that you do. Yeah. Um, and you'd said something about how you know you don't you had this view in yes. the past of not yeah. being a sangha person. That's right. Yeah. Can I say a bit more about about yeah. that? Well, I just think it's I really will. useful for people to hear. Yeah, yeah, it, no, it can be quite a, a sticking point around. Oh, I'm not that type person yeah 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 no it's true i mean i think sangha has been a, a bit of a conundrum for me uh what it what it means to try and sort of understand what it means um i used to have the idea and i think it was even sort of presented i thought to mm. me that that a, a sangha person was a very kind of gregarious sort of uh, outward going maybe quite sort of bubbly sort of person and none of those things really apply to me. So uh, I can be bubbly occasionally, but not, not very often. Uh, so I sort of thought, 
well, where do I where do I belong? I'm quite a well, not as shy as I thought. Okay, that's one thing. I know I'm not as shy as I thought I was, but um, that wasn't something that sort of uh, came easily to me. Mm. And I think that also what was going on there was that I, I thought to myself, oh, well, that's not something that I need to be concerning myself with, you know, I'll practice the Dharma and so forth. But actually, I think what, what was underneath that was it was, it was very important. Sangha was a very important thing because I couldn't really let that go. I sort of, I, you know, the idea of it just being a sort of a social activity, mm. which I felt a bit awkward about, um, I wasn't quite, um, you know, I thought, well, no, it's not, it's not like that. It does touch me in a way. So I need to find out what, what Sangha is uh, mm. for me. And that's when I came up with the idea of, in my mind, of Sangha being an activity, mm. uh, something that would happen. So, you know, Sangha would be something that would happen between you and I talking mm. Mm. Uh, with other members of the team. I live in a Buddhist community, you know, with Sanghanath, you know, who I live with, you know, even talking about cricket, dare I say, you know, it could, <laughs> it could even as we do quite a lot, but we won't now because I'm aware that it's boring for a lot of people. But, oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you want that, it's available at the tea break. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, the... You know, there's that opportunity. Sangha kind of happens. It, it sort of happens, and you sort of know, as it were, when it happens. And it's that it's that spark of the Dharma uh, between people. Um, and actually, it took me a long time to come to that point. You know, I, I think I just sort of um, I just didn't know what to make of Sangha, and 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 I, and I still had it in my mind that well, you have to be a certain sort of person mm. to be a Sangha person. And um, uh, and I've been practicing all this time, and I'm still not that sort of person. Uh, <laughs> and I don't think I will be. You know. uh, I'm less withdrawn than I used to be, but I'm I'm not I'm not that kind of person. So that that was my way of sort of seeing uh, the sangha in my experience. Mm. I also saw that it's a little bit like when people teach you the metabatha. Had a similar experience, you know. Have this warm feeling, you know. It's like, well, what do you do if you don't have a warm feeling? <laughs> Doesn't then you have to consider, well, do I do I love? Am I caring? Do I have metta? Yeah. Well, no. You have to just realise that for me, it's something else. You know, for me, it's it's well, where does it exist? And when I experience the pleasures of working with people, when I experience the, if you like, the um, well, the care and concern that I experience also mm. for people. Uh, I guess that 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 for me is the experience of uh, of sangha. Yeah. So it it's the it's dharma activity when it arises between people. And the other thing about that I would say is that I do very much see because I see it as a verb because I see it as something that you do and not something you sign up for mm. and you call yourself a part of. I see it as open ended as well. Mm. You know, I see it as this, to catch the phrase from the Puja, you know, the, the ever widening circle. And it means that when one is practicing the Dharma, there's always that potential for Sangha in relation to anybody. You know, that, I love that. I love that. That makes a lot to me. Mm. That seems like the perfect place to start <laughs> as well. It's, yeah, just after eight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone else and Liz. So we're going to go into groups now for uh, the next 15 minutes or so, a bit longer if you're online. Um, do you want to join groups or not? It's entirely up to you. I'd quite like to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.